from the center of the universe and the home of your Grey Cup champion, Toronto Argonauts. It's the X's and Argos podcast. Welcome to the X's and Argos post-game reaction podcast brought to you by Something in the Water Brewing. Ben Grant joined as always by JB as we recap Toronto's 29-26 win over the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Just before we get into anything, I just want to apologize for our 24-hour delay on this. We're recording Sunday morning. Um, I don't have a voice, which is why we didn't record yesterday, so I'll do my best to to uh, weather through this. Um, but I apologize if uh, if I cut out halfway through and, and it just ends up being the JB show. So that... Uh, <laughs> That could happen. But JV, just before we get into yesterday's game, let's talk a little bit about something in the water brewing. In Liberty Village, they're just steps from BMO Field. This would be the perfect pregame location for you for the East Final. Uh, you can't beat it in terms of where it's situated. It's it's right there at Lamport Stadium for practices. It's right there at BMO Field for pregame or postgame if it's an afternoon game. And uh, yeah, there's there's nothing better. You can go and try one of their award-winning beers, but you can also uh, try Longboat Pale Ale, the beer that was made for fans of the Double Blue, the the beer with Argos colors and X's and O's on the on the can. Uh, you got to check it out. So please visit Something in the Water Brewing in Liberty Village, and maybe we'll see the, you there before the East Final. All right, JB, this was a pretty wild one. Uh, not the way. I thought it was going to finish for most of that second half. What did you make of it on the whole? <laughs> uh, well, I thought it was going very much according to what I thought it would be. It looked like the Winnipeg game. Uh, Toronto was competitive. Saskatchewan had kind of moved ahead. Um, it looked like Saskatchewan was going to close it out. And then Saskatchewan just threw up all over themselves. Yeah, that's essentially it. And for those watching on YouTube, you can see behind me the standings for the first time since August 5th, have changed. We we finally had Calgary pass Saskatchewan. They were holding on to that spot. It's amazing to me that the order has stayed the same. It's It's been since, since mid-July that we've had a change in the East. Week 5, I think it was. Week 9 for the West. Uh, but yeah, finally there was some movement on the second last week of the season. I, I, felt, I felt bad for Riders fans because this didn't... Like Toronto squeaked out a victory, they won it. It just felt like so many things needed to happen down the stretch for Toronto to be able to win that game. Like walk us through that that final game winning drive that Toronto put together. <laughs> well, I mean, if yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think first of all, I do feel empathy. Anyone who's ever coached defensive football, there is no more helpless, gut wrenching feeling than not being able to stop a final drive. It uh, it absolutely is this sort of existential black hole. Um, Dukes, you know, you, you, if you're Saskatchewan, your season's on the line and a uh, backup quarterback is in and you can't get it done. Uh, Dukes used his legs. Um, he made uh, an amazing third and 10 throw. Uh, they had that, that, the screen that bounced in the air. Uh, Coxie made an unbelievable catch. You know, it, the fates just were not on Saskatchewan's side. There were a couple of massive plays. And then, you know, uh, you have Adeboye, um being amazing. Um, you know, like I didn't think Dukes looked... Look, Dukes looked fine. I guess we've talked about that. He looked fine. He, he certainly didn't turn the ball over. And with the team this good, that's all you're looking for, really, from your backup quarterback is don't give the ball away. You know, we'll, the defense will keep giving you chances. And they did. And I thought... You know, Dukes made some nice uh, throws to the sideline. And uh, and more importantly, and I think people really underestimate how hard it is to not throw an interception um, in the CFL. And the defense is varied and coming guys are coming out of all over the place. And the fact that Dukes did not throw a pick uh, and got some some all-star catches, uh, you know, I think just shows how, how deep how deep the Argos roster is. And, uh, you know, I I mean, I'm never going to be a Dukes fan, but, I mean, they were behind. He drove them down with two minutes left to win the game. So I, I got to give him his – I got to give him his flowers. Yeah, I, I thought he did everything and more. And, you know, that's the third – it's the third 
opportunity he's had. And I, I wrote a little bit about this on, on Three Down Nation. If you want to check out that that article, those are sort of my my full thoughts, uh, some of which we'll get into today. Uh, but for expanded versions and more thought through yeah. takes, you can check that out. But Dukes, for me, this was his third chance to come from behind on a game winning drive. So there's one preseason. We remember in Hamilton, he got put back in right at the end. I think Brian Scott had been in and then they put Dukes in to see can this kid lead a touchdown drive, and he didn't quite get there in Hamilton. This was, again, preseason. Then against Winnipeg, they put him back in the game in the final drive to see, can the kid pull it out? And it wasn't to be. And here it was again. He wasn't put back in, but this was another opportunity. Let's see Dukes try a game-winning drive. And and he he hit it. He needed every down and and every yard, but, but he got it. I mean, as a defensive coordinator, to to have Sindani catch that third and ten, I mean, that just, you know, you, you always say, well, if their number four receiver beats us, we'll tip our hat, but you don't really mean it. <laughs> and uh, to to have him, I mean, it just, I, I did feel bad for the defensive coordinator because, you know, you just do not build a defense to stop Sindani. And for him to catch that seam that, you know, in a competitive a uh, competitive catch situation uh, that just uh, that just has to gut you. It was such a beautiful catch by Sandani too. He high oh, pointed right. that an absolute all star catch from your your fourth look. <laughs> well, Duke seemed to be going there right away because, like, as the play was developing, like, well, because I'm sure, because I'm sure that like, obviously the defense is, is not keying on him. They weren't keying on him, but but it wasn't like he was wide open either. No, like no, they were no. dropping into coverage. Yeah. And so there weren't a lot of looks. But yeah, like pre-snap, when I'm going through kind of like what I'm looking at, uh, one of the last things I look at is who is where. And so I knew where Sindani was on that play. And as Dukes is dropping back, I'm not thinking that that's where he's going. When he released but, the ball in my head, I was like, oh, my God, he's going to Sindani. Let's see how this goes. Because they haven't worked it. Like he's just he just arrived. Like he probably hasn't unpacked his bags they, yet. They pro- I don't know. I wonder. I wonder if they've had more work together. You know, again with that kind of like Kelly, and and you know the, sure. the backup receivers. I wonder if they actually had some work together. For sure, they have. Um, you know, but but it hasn't been backup, very long. Backup. No, it, no, that's the thing, right? Like, so even if they run every snap, like it's quite possible every snap Sandani's taken has been with Dukes at quarterback in practice. But yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we're only talking about a, a couple of weeks here. So, uh, but I think it's, it's big, like coach Dimity after the game talked about how Sandani knows the system because, you know, having, you know, started in, in Calgary, uh, and I know he was most recently in Hamilton, but he's played under, uh, this system or similar system before to coach Dinwiddie's. And so uh, Dinwiddie did mention that. And I think that has to help. Um, but what a what a moment for Sandani. I was so happy for him because of just how like I, I, I think he's overlooked and you know how things ended in Hamilton. Uh it was great to see to see him and and Sandani, I think I'm I'm pretty sure he's a Saskatchewan guy, right? Like I think he's from there. Um and so again in his in his home place, um that was that was pretty awesome. Yeah, I think Sandani, I think Sandani and and Haggerty went to the same high school in Saskatchewan. I think that's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know how to look that up right now. But yeah, I think that is correct. And so there in his home stadium to make that play uh, was was something. Uh, so let's let's get into some of the other other elements to to recap here. Um, let's start with guys that started guys that were getting rests. Most of the offense went. Uh, Dejon Allen didn't go at right tackle. Uh, they're still holding uh, re- receivers like we don't know. We don't know the the status of Phillips and Curly Gittins Jr. We don't know if they're coming back or not. But um, if they are, they're at least still being held out right now for rest. Uh, what do you make of the the play of uh, Tate at right tackle? I want to talk about uh, Boris Beattie sitting and Gachu's getting in there. How did you see all those guys playing in, in relief? Yeah, uh, I think Tate had a hard day. Um I think that uh, there definitely was more contact on the quarterback than we normally see. Um, that one uh, sack fumble was a really clean look. I mean, thankfully, it was it was okay, but it was a pretty clean hit on uh, on Kelly. Um, so I, I do think there were definitely some issues they didn't. Uh, Lozada didn't look great. Um, 
he was okay. I mean, he he was okay. His his kickoff was fine. Um, you know, his uh, he, he you know he he went three for four on field goal. Uh, they didn't look particularly well struck or clean. If I were to kind of be technical about it, but I thought he was fine. You know, three for four is pretty good. So it's like you have to bring somebody in. But I wasn't. It, it wasn't. A, I didn't think it was that clean or that crisp a game from from Lozada and, and Tate. Uh, I think had had some challenges um, with guys on the outside. Yeah, Tate. I actually think I think Tate actually played a, a decent game, but he had two really big misses where guys beat him with speed around the outside. One was the Chad Kelly hit, and when I saw that happen, I thought I thought the worst right away because he was he was in the midst of his throwing motion, and we've seen so many times quarterbacks suffer elbow injuries, shoulder injuries on hits like that. He was he didn't. Even though he's coming at his face, like Kelly's locked in downfield, didn't see it coming. And so he's sort of in mid throw and then he gets just crushed by a defensive end uh, who came pretty clean around the outside. And then there was another one late in the game where Dukes took a hit on um, a significant down. I can't remember the situation exactly, but it was it was a very similar speed move around the outside and, and Tate just didn't get him. I, I think aside from those two plays... He actually played all right, but you can't. But those two plays are so big. It's you often talk about this, like as a as a DB, if you have if you make a mistake, it's a touchdown, and it's a little bit like that at tackle. Like if you if you have a bad play, it might be your only one all game, but it could sink you. And um, yeah, I mean, you know that you know you 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 see that sometimes, right? You bring in a backup, or somebody gets injured, and then like your quarterback basically gets knocked out. And, I think it is a different conversation. I think it also is another factor. I know the media is, you know, lathered up to to jump on Toronto if Kelly were to get hurt and they get on their high horse about, you know, players shouldn't play and so forth, which is tiring to listen to. Um, but I do think another factor in is if you don't have your full starting line, uh, that that's another kind of data set to consider when you're leaving Kelly in. Dinwiddie said after the game that the plan was for Kelly to come out at half if they had the lead, but they didn't have the lead. And so he decided to keep Kelly in to the end of the, th- the third. Now, he didn't end up making it there. He ended up pulling Kelly a little early because uh, the of the ankle injury. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But, but the plan evolved because clearly they wanted to win the football game. And it's because otherwise you would have pulled him at half. I guess as had sort of been originally thought, but they wanted to they wanted to win. They wanted to come yeah. out with with a victory. Um, that's I, I'm torn on how to feel about that. I, I admire it. I like the fact that Kelly is still playing. I do think I do think you handle it sort of preseason ish. But I, I I wanted to see Brian Scott in there today or yesterday. I guess this is. I thought I'm, they. I'm a... Sorry, go on. No, I love two minds too. I agree. You know, part of me is like I know it's all about the championship. Yeah, but I mean. And like it is and it isn't. Yes, of course you're trying to win the championship, but but like if you're not, you know, I don't know, a talk radio host, it's not just about winning championships. You can't have like every season you don't win the championship is a waste of time. Like that that's a preposterous sort of attitude to have because like you're not gonna win the championship most of the time. Um, you know, of course that's the goal, but it doesn't like eliminate or or erase everything. I hate when when people talk about that, it's so reductive. And they're knocking on history's door. You, you look at, you know, 16 wins, it puts them in, uh, you know, puts them in the record books in all kinds of different categories. And I know you're not going to sacrifice the whole season for it, but I don't think you should ignore when you're right there on a historic season. I I, I agree with that. I think, I think that's a legitimate thought process and conversation that you're that you take into that you take into account of course you don't want the record over a championship but to dismiss the record as nothing i think is is incorrect i agree and talking to some of the the players and and dinwiddie also yesterday they feel similarly that's sort of the vibe i get and and speaking you mentioned uh uh, otherwise, the the regular season is a, is a waste of time. Back to the helmets behind me, over my right shoulder. This is the exact same order that the standings finished last season. Nothing has changed. Everyone's in the exact same spot, <laughs> and the playoff matchups are exactly the same. <laughs> well, I it's, mean, it's twenty twenty two all over again. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is a problem. I think a little bit, but it's weird. It's just really weird. Like off off Hamilton goes to Montreal, off Calgary goes to BC, Winnipeg and Toronto wait around third straight for the third straight time. Uh, it's odd, but anyway, let's let's continue through our our recap. Um, let's talk about that Kelly ankle injury. So um, he ends up. This was this was late in the third quarter. Um, he ends up getting taken down and sort of uh, twisted. His, his ankle is kind of twisted at the end. Uh, how did you see that play? Um, what did it look like to you? Yeah, to me, it was dirty. Um, it was late, and all you could argue, well, he didn't know it was late, but that's, you know, that's part of his job. He has to know it's late. It's late. He had already got rid of the ball. Um, Kelly was not trying to run away. He wasn't trying to run down the field. And then the defensive lineman clearly just tried to twist his ankle. It wasn't even a gator roll. It was he grabbed one ankle and twisted it like you would do with a running back. Uh, I thought it was dirty. I thought it should have been flagged. Um, and uh, I'm going to go on a, a bit of a rant a little bit later about uh central command and the refereeing but uh yeah i thought i I thought absolutely it was a dirty play i initially thought that too and i i I, it's not that i've stopped thinking that but what i looked for when i watched the replays i'm trying to find i want to know for sure that anthony lanier the second doesn't know the ball is gone and i'm not sure he does but that's i also think it's being a bit naive to look at it that way because you get you know uh, you know how football plays work. Like this guy's, you know, he's Anthony's played a lot of football, obviously. And um, there's Kelly was just standing there. That's he the was thing. not like, running. As soon as there's no more resistance, like when the quarterback kind of goes goes he's, still, he, the he ball's was just gone. standing there. Like he twisted his things. Like he wasn't trying to run. Like he was. Yeah. I mean, it makes me mad because you know Saskatchewan is sinking to the bottom of the wheat field, and here they are trying to, uh, you know trying to hurt, which is not the first time something like that has happened in Saskatchewan. Yeah, that's true. And that's going to come up a lot as well. I want to see how the, will. I I mean, see how the league guy, looks at I it. Mean, like, do you think he gets fined is the question that no, I, I'm wondering. By, you mean by the by the league that allowed the head hit on Dukes without it being a penalty? No. Well, let, let's get into that rant then. Good. Good. I'm ready. <laughs> Go um, look, I know Dinwiddie almost laughed at how ridiculous it is, but... Oakman got called for uh, a roughing that was not a roughing at all. Uh, it was a quarterback ducking his head down into Oakman's waist who kind of gently put him down like a small baby. And he got a penalty. And then Dukes is, is sliding and he takes a headshot on the slide. It's like a forearm to the helmet kind of. Right. And I mean, I don't want to go too off on the TSN guys, but they're like, oh, he slid late. Like, that's not a rule. He slid late. If he slides, he is protected with a halo the same way a punt returner is, and he took a headshot, and I don't care if he dove at the last second. It's a penalty. It's a penalty. I can see how maybe the field misses it, but how can command not call that a penalty? He took a shot to the head when he was sliding. Like There's no discussion. There's no ambiguity. It is absolutely a penalty, and I want to know who is making that decision. Who's making that decision? The head of referees? Is there a name that we have? Yeah. Like that call is un I know Dinwiddie didn't go crazy because at this point he's used to being overridden by uh whatever Hamilton Ticat is in the in central command. But what is happening? How is that not a penalty? I mean, in every way it's a penalty. There there is no ambiguity. I would love they couldn't. I would love to hear a, a CFL uh, official explain how that was not contact of the head while the quarterback was giving themselves up. I was surprised at that one too. And Dimity is still yet to win a challenge this year with only one game to go. He may I not know. win a we challenge. We used to this kill year. him on, but I mean, there's been at least three that are just flat out preposterous. And they've all involved a quarterback where essentially was like, no, it's fine. Yeah, I, it was so weird, especially like you said, like the same crew that that called the open one, which I, I still never saw. They didn't even talk about the broadcast. I still never saw where he made contact. He he hugged him and took him to the ground like, uh, you know, like th- there was there couldn't have been a gentler 
take to the ground. But it's one, that's one of those cases where they're looking very literally at the rule. And but why do it on that play and then not on this play with with Dukes? I agree. I thought yeah. that was weird. No, no. Made, me, made me insane. I obviously. bet. I know. Like some of uh, some of the texts I receive from you mid game are are <laughs> awesome. Because <laughs> sometimes like I don't if if I didn't know the context, I wouldn't understand what <laughs> you were talking about. Because it's usually just an outburst of rage. It's true. Um, a little more a little more profane than than pod talk. But yeah, uh, I mean they are now my mortal enemy uh central command uh, i can see that know, the i don't i don't understand it i don't get it it's it's laughable i don't coach thinks it's laughable uh I, I i don't understand and i i demand that the cfl have somebody explain these decisions unless i guess they don't answer to anybody or well i guess they don't <laughs> i guess i don't need to ask that question and for those that didn't listen to jb's rant last week uh what what you want is transparency. So you want to hear the conversation like the rugby world cup is on right now. And I think a lot of people, a lot more people have probably watched rugby recently than normally watch rugby. That's, that's a, that's a, a league and a sport where transparency has really improved. You hear the dialogue back and forth between video replay and the official you hear, actually you hear the official all the time. The officials mic. you hear everything the official says. And so nothing, there's nothing that's that's hidden. Uh, I don't know if it needs to go that far. I don't know if we need the officials all if, mic'd with if, everything. Yeah, if they can't do it live, <clears throat> if they can't do it live, there's no reason on Monday that there can't be uh, a 20 minute YouTube video where they discuss all of the central decisions. I would be simply, in favor of that. Simply walk us through. Here's this decision. Here's this decision. I mean, these are games that have significant impact. Um, I, I don't know why decisions are made and there is no no ability to to be held accountable. Um, it's really frustrating. I mean, why why don't you why don't you on Monday um, have it? There should be no reason you would say no. You you know why you made your decision is based on the rule book. But anyways, I wonder <laughs> if Coach Dewey had challenged the late hit on Chad Kelly, if that would have been. Uh, if that would have resulted in a penalty, because that to me was more a like it wasn't a late hit per se, but I think I, I feel like he might have won that challenge because you can clearly see an aggressive move being it's delivered. Clearly, a low tackle. Well, you know, like or at least the spirit of of the rule in a low tackle. It's not like diving at the knees, but it, it, to me, it's just late action. Like whatever it was, whether you think it's dirty or not, well after the ball is gone force is being applied to the quarterback uh in this case a twist of the leg but to me that is a that's that's not a textbook late hit but that should be a late hit so well, i wonder I should, if he challenged there should have been flagged on the field too but yeah we'll get no that. i know all right well moving on from central command and uh <laughs> maybe a topic that will make you a little bit more happy uh let's talk about some of the the milestones that i thought were kind of cool so i was surprised at like when i when I asked Coach Dimity about this after the game, I, I didn't think he would answer it this way. I asked him how much individual milestones factored into uh, play calling and getting guys the ball. And he acknowledged that it actually did quite a bit. Now, he did say it didn't take us off our, our, normal, our, our normal game plan or anything like that. But he was very aware of where everyone was. He knew where AJ was in terms of getting to his uh his thousand yards he knew where Tavares was and he was constantly talking to coach Harrison up in the booth to ask where they were and as soon as AJ got over his thousand he's like okay let's pull him and Tavares they found out remember Tavares got banged up on a play he yeah he took, he took yeah he took that big hit he took a big hit um on a ball that he almost always catches he had another really big game I expected him to be kind of quiet this week I actually might have sat him this week but of course the it, it's correct not to because he he really wanted that thousand yards, and I think, I think there's value in that. And Coach Dinwiddie found out Devaris was a yard short, and so out he went, and they immediately tried to target him to pick that up. It means a lot to players. Like coaches, you know, you, you probably you talked about this earlier. We talked about what's the ultimate goal to win a Grey Cup. You don't want to put your guys in jeopardy. There's value in a coach caring about players' individual milestones marks that mean something to individuals thousand yards for Devaris Daniels he's never had it never had a thousand yard season got close in his rookie year didn't get it and 
AJ Olet has never had a thousand yards rushing. Like these marks matter to those guys. Yeah. And to, for me, I thought that was huge in terms of how the room will look at coach Dinwiddie. I think that is something that will endear him to the team. Like they, they love him anyway. The guys love playing for coach Dinwiddie, but things like this make it even more so. Yeah. I mean, look, you, you, if you're a quarterback and you play your whole career and you don't win a great cup with your career, a waste of time, you know, of course not. Um, the, to, to get into the CFL record book or to have, um, you know, uh, an accomplishment like a thousand yards. I mean, that, that's the thing you can, you know, you can hold on to forever, like hitting 300 in the majors or, you know, scoring 50 goals. I mean, to, to have that as an accomplishment is, is an amazing, um, achievement. And also like all of the work that's put in all of the training. Yes, of course it is to win a championship, but, uh, I agree. I think it's fantastic that the guys it's recognized that these personal achievements are important and, and, sh- you know, should not be, you know, a- you know, attempted for at at the risk of everything, but definitely should be should be worked towards because those guys deserve it. It, it isn't just about team success. You know, I think that's a. I think that's a really narrow view. It's not a zero sum game. You you can do both. You can be about the team and also celebrate personal success. Let's talk about some of the individuals that really stepped up in this game. I, I said in our pregame walkthrough episode last week that this is probably going to be a big Demonte Coxie game because he needed to get going again, just like Tavares Daniels did last week. Um, and it's it's not that these guys have been playing badly. They just hadn't been targeted a lot. And Coxie didn't have a touchdown since the playoff clinching game in Montreal. He'd been pretty quiet. Uh, I think he had one one big game in there. But he went out and had maybe his best game of the season. I think the only other one that you could match it with would be the, the season opener for Toronto in Week 2, where he had 131 yards receiving against Hamilton, but no touchdown in that one. Yeah, I mean, um, that catch on the final drive was unbelievable to get. He got his foot and his shoulder down. Yeah, no, it was huge. The, the move he made on the go route as well, the touchdown, like he he got he didn't get wide open by accident. Uh, that was, that's him. Um, and uh, to be able to sort of physical through that as well, get yourself wide open, make the touchdown catch. And yeah, to catch that leaping back shoulder, stay in bounds with the game on the line uh, was was a huge thing. And I thought he was just a star uh, in yesterday's game. So yeah, that was a huge one for him. Uh, Adebaboye. Oh, wow. I mean, <laughs> such a great story when you look at all of the time he's put in, you know, in terms of like not necessarily getting a lot of reps, doing a lot of special teams, becoming a special teams ace, um, being basically whatever the Argos need. He's He was, you know, talented and um, hardworking and just, you know, put his head down and grinded uh, for the Argos. You know, the coaches loved him. And we talked about it last week where we saw little flashes of what he might be able to do. And then today was amazing. I thought today he he absolutely showed that he can be – uh, the you know the compliment next year when when Harris uh, retires, yeah, that's uh, that was huge because exactly that. Like you know, roster building, we don't need to go out and find another guy. We don't need to find a replacement for Andrew Harris because he's here. That's sort of yeah. the how they're going to look at it in the room. Like they're going to be looking at each other. Like do catching, we need this? Catching screens, catching passes out of the backfield. I thought he looked really light on his feet. Um. You know, I I just I could honestly I had to double take a couple of times to make sure it wasn't AJ. Yeah, no, uh, he, he you was know, he, he was great. He looked fantastic today. Nine carries, 109 yards, and and that touchdown and the touchdown was where you saw the power side of it because it wasn't like it was from the one. It was it was like it was a three and a half yard line yeah, or a four oh yeah. yard line, and he just it looked like it looked like sled work. Um, you know, he just went horizontal. He was he was just inches above the ground and well, you I mean, could see those legs just driving. I'm just going to say he, he has, he has strong legs. He does. Uh, if you haven't heard the story before, you probably have from someone, either Mike Hogan or myself, but um, he needs to buy custom shorts because his quads are too big to fit into <laughs> normal person shorts, <laughs> which uh, you saw the effect of that right there when he took the whole Saskatchewan defensive line and decided to drive them into the end zone. Just like one step at a time, it looked like it looked like those strongman competitions when you see them moving like a jet. 
You know, yeah, like they've my, got a rope tied to a jet plane jet, behind them. Shout and out Magnus Magnuson. Magnus Magnuson from <laughs> Iceland. Uh, and they get almost horizontal because you have to just to get the momentum going. Like he was, he was almost flat to the ground and just driving. And that the strength to to be able to score a touchdown on that play was was huge. You I know, was almost wondering there if if they wanted him to get in there or actually take another 20 seconds off the clock and then sneak it in but of course you in that situation you try and score the touchdown there's no doubt but yeah we can well we can talk about the clock too about the tackle and bounds but um you know who else i thought played really really well was uh, jordan williams oh yeah yeah it was uh, nice. I, I think it might have been jordan williams best game in a, an Argo. in a really quiet way though because it wasn't like he had a highlight real plays no, no, but he was right. so disciplined and because they don't need him to be a star Right. Like, you know, everybody on the, you can't have seven stars on the defense. That's the problem. Um, but I thought he, I thought his, uh, it got blitz was fantastic. I'd love to see them work that in a little more. Uh, I just thought he flashed. I thought he, I thought he looked maybe a hundred percent back from his injury. And, um, I mean, that's amazing. If you can add a Jordan Williams at a hundred percent, uh, to that linebacker crew, um, you know, I, I was, I was really happy with how with how well he played. And he played a lot more true middle than he usually does. Like often he, he's he's usually listed as the middle linebacker, Winton as as the will, but Winton plays a lot of middle linebacker positionally, even though they don't call him that. He ends up in the middle a lot. And this time it was Williams, like you said, with those with those egg blitzes and and I thought he just held down the fort extremely well, which doesn't sound like that doesn't sound like the compliment that I mean it to sound. Uh, but he uh, he did his job extremely well. So yeah, no, yeah. I agree. I mean, Morrow was was basically shut down. Now <laughs> the passing game was not shut down. Um, no, but that but, was the key. They went after the run. Yeah. They decided, okay, if, no, if we're going to lose, Dola Gala is going to be the guy that beats us. We are not going to let them run on us. Saskatchewan had 13 rushing yards in the first yeah. half. They ended up Amazing. with 37 rushing yards. They, it's like two yards a carry uh, all game. And that was, they're like, make Dola Gala beat us. And ultimately he couldn't. He he had two crushing interceptions. One in yeah. the end zone, Qantas Stiggers made on a throw that just shouldn't have been, shouldn't have been thrown. And then the other hey. one, the Mason Pierce pick at the end of the game. So you won at the beginning in the end zone. The I thought that was a points. weird pl- uh, play design too, because they had, it was kind of like a, a cross, right? Like the receivers crossed each other, but then the underneath guy did an out along with the corner, bringing stiggers with them into the end zone. Yeah. It looked like something was off there like, or why the would, timing I don't was know off. why you would run an out and a corner or an out and a fade because why, why are you bringing that corner over to where the throw is going with that? He can now come off. Like I just thought to, it, uh, well, to the boundary side, solid. like you can do that, like to have an out in a corner, isn't that unusual, but you want to be in short space. Like you want to be over to the boundary hash. Cause you've got to fire that in because that's the, the risk of that. And we almost saw that like on the Mason Pierce pick is a similar thing. It's a, it's another flood concept where if the short coverage ends up sinking, right. uh, it's now, a dangerous now, thing. Right now you're screwed. That was, it was one of the first lessons I learned in offensive coaching with the smash concept, which I love, where you've got a, a corner from the inside and you've got a hook on the outside. And like in man coverage, that the corner is always a nice target. But every so often you get a cornerback on the on who's covering the hook route who is watching the quarterback uh, is the quarterback's eyes he's playing off and then he bails on the hook and can pick off that that corner it can undercut it and i think stiggers and peters right. as well are so just, good at that it just shows stiggers development you know that like how just how great he can be for him to be able to 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 jump that yeah and he sees what's happening the same thing happened on the mason pierce pick where stiggers has the short route and then Bain has like an out in behind him and he sees Dolagala's eyes and he understands the concept. Like he knows that he's being brought in because something's happening behind him. And and so he bails out and that forced Dolagala to, to change the, the arc, the trajectory of the ball. And now it has to go over top of Stiggers. And that extra time is what allowed Pierce to come in and, and make that play on the, on the sideline. That, uh, was that, that coaching line that, uh, you know, good players do what you teach them. And great players, you know, or the, the sorry, great players do what you teach them, and good players only do what you teach them. And right. uh, you know, I think on a, a Stiggers play there, right? Like whether they taught that or not, you know, like that's not his guy. Like that's not, you know, he's reacting to that. He he has the under, um, and you know, he could have just stayed on that under, and coach would have been fine. 
Um, but you know, he that's the advantage of having a great player is that they see that they read the quarterback, they get off the coverage that they're supposed to do, and he goes and gets it. Let's get into our plays of the game, JB. Uh, what was your play of the game from mm. from this one? Um, well, there were, there were a couple of different ones. I thought I'd go a little, a slight hipster pick here. Um, I thought my play of the game was in the first half, uh, the Argos were down 17-7 and Kelly threw that underthrown ball for another, another, uh, defensive back coming off his guy and jumping the underneath. Um, and so now Saskatchewan is driving a 17-7 and I think potentially, could could put the game out of out of hand. Maybe you pull all the starters or a number of the starters if Calgary goes up 24-7. And the defense just absolutely came in. You had a picket sack. And then my play of the game was a, a really simple one. You had Peters being doubled and uh, McManus also being blocked. And both get off their blocks and make the tackle to end the drive. And it's such a small little play, but it's such a microcosm of what Toronto does well and that Kelly is driving. There's a mistake. He turns over the ball. The defense just holds fast, gives him back the ball. He immediately gives it to AJ, who rips off a huge run. Uh, they go down and get a field goal, and now they're back in the game. They've been doing it all season. You know, that that kind of relationship between the defense constantly giving Kelly more more quarters, more more tries at it. And, it, you know, it, it's just a beautiful football play to to have a, a defensive back being doubled and still getting off the block and making the tackle. I mean, that's the kind of stuff you dream about in, in coach's film. Usually you're screaming in coach's film about you got to get off that block, you got to get off the block. Um, you know, it's, it's a small little football play that maybe doesn't get a ton of notice. But it to me it it, it changes the game uh, because now Toronto's back in it, and and of course they go on to win it. Yeah, that was that was a that's like you said it's it's what the Argos have done all year. Like Chad Kelly has had an amazing st- season, should be most outstanding player. Uh, I don't think he will be, or should be. But anytime he has made a mistake, like you said, the defense has been there to to get his back, or special teams, or something like anytime someone messes up. The, the defense messes up. They blow a coverage, easy touchdown for someone while well, the offense comes right back and scores a touchdown. They, they yeah, have exactly. each other. And then, and then that's how he picks them up. Exactly. Right. Where like, you know, they get that blown change of possession and, and, and Saskatchewan scores a touchdown, but you know, Kelly is right there to keep them in shouting distance all the time. Yeah. My play of the game was as it always is more obvious than than your <laughs> quote unquote hipster pick. Uh, it was the the interception from Mason Pierce at the end of the game. This was, I thought, a really savvy play from a guy that we were initially pretty worried about coming in because to lose both halfbacks like that, both like all star level halfbacks in Deshaun Amos and Robertson Daniel. Robertson Daniel was probably the defensive MVP at that stage of the season. And he goes down and in comes Mason Pierce. And you're like, man, this rookie from the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, you know, I love what, that. What's the, I know I do. The um, Colorado School of Mines has got so many shout outs. Every time someone brings him up. They yeah, because everybody school. loves it. Everybody yeah. loves it. Yeah. It's amazing. And and it's, you know, he's uh, the, like those guys. It, it's not a known football program, but. <laughs> it's not a known anything. N- no, well, it is, I guess, in the like ore mining industry. Um, <laughs> these guys are all like like ridiculously smart engineers or something like that. But um, yeah, Pierce Pierce came in and he had his best game, best game of his career uh, in, in this one. The pick, I want to talk about the pickup because that is my play of the game. But I also want to tell you something he said about uh, his sack, which I, I thought was um, was kind of funny. So on the pick, it's a savvy play. Um, he He's watching Bain, uh, who's really, I think he had, I think he was in the middle of the trips. He ends up with a deep out and Pierce breaks on it really early. Is able to undercut that route and pick off the ball. And I think had maybe had an opportunity to stay in bounds and run it back. But the more important thing at that stage of the game, securing the interception is all that matters. And so it was smart to, instead of trying to dance and keep your feet in bounds and risk not catching the ball cleanly, he does the smart thing, grabs the ball, goes to ground, and and Toronto almost had it from there. Saskatchewan did get one more shot. The clock got a little weird. Um, 
We, you know, we don't need to talk about that probably, but um, yeah, really a heads up play from Mason Pierce. Uh, what he said on it after the game was that he knew the situation. They were probably going to want to get out of bounds. So he was kind of favoring sideline routes anyway from his deep coverage responsibility. So he was, as soon as Bain broke out, he's thinking that that's where the ball is going. And that's just a, that's a smart uh, play from a first year player. Um, and the story I wanted to share on the blitz is that we've seen we've seen Pierce get sent on halfback blitzes like every third play since he's come in. They love blitzing Mason Pierce. I think early when he came in, it was it was an easy thing to do because early he still didn't have a lot of experience. And you don't necessarily want to leave him out there and uh, isolated in coverage. So early uh, they send him a lot, but they've continued to send him on blitzes. Has not got home once and. Finally, yesterday, like Saskatchewan was doing such a good job, Morrow especially, of of picking up blitzes. And Morrow, I don't think he was in on this play. He was lined up on Dolagala's left side. Pierce is coming from Dolagala's right, and nobody touched him. He just came in and and leveled Dolagala, picked up his his first sack. And he was, when I talked to him, he was more excited to talk about that sack than he was about the game-winning pick because the guys had been on him. And I want to read you the exact quote here so I don't get this wrong. He said, I've been getting talk from the guys. They said if I don't get one soon, they're going to have to take all the blitzes for me. So I'm happy I got that one. And he had this huge smile on his face. Um, he couldn't he couldn't be happier to have picked up that sack. Because again, he's been sent like like 15 times on halfback blitzes and never once got to the QB. I can I can hear the defensive film room right yes. now watching those watching those blitzes and guys asking coach, coach, send me. Yeah. Send me coach. Yeah, no, that was, um, <laughs> you could see like, there was so much like, um, subtext in his grin as he was telling that story. Uh, cause I could, I could do the same thing. I could hear the voices of, of all the other DBs every time Pierce didn't go. And in the film room, there's going to be, there'll be something said when they, when they get through that play, uh, from, uh, from film today. So, um, yeah, I couldn't have been happier for him. He just, yeah, he was he was thrilled at getting that sack, and of course the the game winning um, pick, and, and maybe coach clinching, and maybe well that that pick like that swings so many things, like not just the stand. He's like that that play. Um, you, you talk about how much change can come from one play, but yeah, does that does that play is that play what won the game if so is that play what results in turnover in coaching and management if, and like lives coach, are upturned like i i think if coach mason in saskatchewan he can thank mason pierce <laughs> I, 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 I think if saskatchewan wins that game and if they make the playoffs uh they don't fire everybody and i think now they do i think i think it's going to be a clean house situation in saskatchewan and um you know we talked about you know, maybe it's it's going to be the BC coach, but I you know, I do think ironically, uh, Mason Pierce may have sent his defensive coordinator to Regina. I think it'll be Maximic, just because I think they'll favor an offensive guy over a defensive guy. Um, and Coach Mace will get his shot one day. I just well, depends don't... who wins the Grey Cup. Truthfully, I think I think if the Argos win the Grey Cup, that moves him to the top of the list. You think so? Eh? Maybe. Yeah. Like, I, well, depending he... on what what happens with BC. I mean, BC just got thrown around the playroom by Calgary. So I, I, you know, I mean, I know it's all up and down, but I think it really depends on the playoffs. I think, I think if, if, if the Argos have a good playoff run, I think he goes to the top of the list. I mean, obviously I'm biased, but yeah, no, he's like, he should be at the top of the list. I get the, I get the, I get the love for Maximic. I think he's great. I think he's a, a really good offensive. Coordinator. I mean, I hope they go with him, you know, believe me, like <laughs> if we can, if we can keep coach another year, I mean, that would be unbelievable. I'm all for Saskatchewan making the wrong choice. Yeah. Um, no, I, I know you are for sure. Speaking of the wrong choices, we'll have to get into our uh, bets oh, when we do our uh, pregame walkthrough <laughs> next week. That's something that we've got to look forward to. I'm going to have to go to Zeus for a marker, I believe. <laughs> Get some more fleeces. Uh, yeah. That's a pretty good line. Uh, all right. Before we wrap things up, um, this is this is the situation we talked about a few weeks ago. The Argos are in a position now. They go into Ottawa. Uh, do you? How do you approach this last game? We'll talk about this more in detail in, in our pregame walkthrough coming up midweek, but just kind of to leave you with that before we go, because 
asking Coach Dimity about Chad Kelly after the game, he wasn't sure. He was non-committal on next week. And I think that's I think you have to be kind of post-game. You're sort of still digesting. They want to make sure his ankle's good and stuff too. Winning in Ottawa I, puts I you in play for the best yeah, season of all I know. time. I mean, it is an interesting debate, and I'll have to ponder a little more. I I lean towards doing exactly what they did last year. Just I mean, I taking think, everyone. Well, out. you win the Great Cup last year. I think you just do exactly what you did last year. Would you know? I think that that decision has shown to be to be one that works. So I think you. I think you follow that again. I really do. Yeah, I think I think that probably is the call. Um, but we'll we'll see especially how things with go. The, especially with the ankle tweak, make oh. I think it. I think then to be not the nice thing. Hopefully, you know everything's okay. Um, but it it I think the ankle tweak lets coach off the hook, and he's able to make that decision with uh, very little pushback. Yeah, I, I, well, there'll be pushback, but he doesn't have to listen to it. There'll be pushback from Kelly, like he yeah, already no, talked I, about. But it's like, easier I, for coach to. It's to, true to make his, you know, like it. It is what it is with your ankle, and uh, so I, I think that works out fine as long as the ankle's fine. But Kelly likes, like, he just loves to play. And he even even in this game, he wanted to go back in. He was asking Coach to go back in. And Coach <laughs> no. is like, no, sit down. You're not going back in. Um, that was one of my, actually one of my favorite questions uh, that I asked Chad Kelly was what it was like on the sideline in that two-minute drill that they were doing. And yeah, he you could see in his face like he 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 says he you know he says all the right things. He's he's a great teammate. He's you know just out there pulling for Cam Dukes and and cheering him along. But it must have been so tough. Uh, just the competitor that he is, like you want to be on the field so badly, um, and not having control over that is 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 one of the most difficult things when you start coaching is is to not uh, to realize that you don't have control. There's nothing you can do beyond you know sending in the play and getting guys prepped. You can't. You can't go out there and, and make the play. And I think Chad, um, having had that brief experience uh, with coaching at uh, it was EMCC, um, I think probably had a few flashbacks from that. And because he was just jumping up and down on the sideline, he's he's yelling and pointing things out. He's in the ref's ear. Um, he was more into that final drive. That's when I knew his ankle was was OK because he's, he's hopping up and yeah. down on the sideline. So I, one quick thing, as you were saying that I, I, I wanted to jump in on before we get out of here. Uh, one of the reasons I hope Coach May stays, uh, did you see that guillotine play he used where Saskatchewan ran a screen successfully, and then for some reason, <laughs> they went right back to it. And Coach had this play set up where Peters came in and hit Morrow harder. Okay. Like, it was just such obvious, like, oh, you want to run this? Oh, run it again, please. And then they did. And I just love the coach. It's like, okay, you run that screen. That was successful. Why don't you run it again? And they did, and Morrow paid the price. I just love how Coach was able to to react to that and, you know, just demolish the Saskatchewan OC for for trying to run the same screen twice in a row, as if as if he had found some uh, hole in the armor. Yeah, like Morrow's definitely still feeling that one oh today. Oh my he god, got hit so it, it was hard. just such a kill shot. They were just dreaming, like, please run that screen again. Well, they're usually pretty quick reacting to those, like Stiggers too. Like both those guys are so big and hit so hard, and they're yeah. really good at playing down. Like they leave them in. They leave it was them absolutely in flats a, lot. a trap. Like it was absolutely yeah. like they were back. Yeah, they were and baiting. Like, oh, oh, baiting oh, it's a screen. I'm like, no, no, yeah, that's look, all. Look how open this at. guy is. I know. <laughs> no, they he, he, he crushed them. That was that was the hit of the the game oh my god well that will just about do it for us on this uh post-game reaction episode of the x's and argos podcast again the argonauts beat the rough riders 29 26 next game is saturday in ottawa where the toronto argonauts have a chance to make history make sure you catch our pregame walkthrough episode coming at you midweek for jb this is ben grant saying so long and may all your pre-snap reads be good ones i'll see you Fight the foe, foe, foe.